I have worked with many successful professionals that are depending upon the accommodations that they've had their whole lives. And suddenly those accommodations don't work because the electronic medical records don't care if you need to be perfect before you submit them. And so you're delaying. The school doesn't care whether or not you need extra time to submit your grades so that they can close out the semester. It really is important for parents to not depend on the idea when their child goes to college that the goal is to find a college that will continue to accommodate in the absence of skill building. Welcome to season six of Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about a family's anxiety and all the big feelings too. We tackle the serious stuff without being too serious. And I'm your co-host, Robin. I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author. And I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. I'll give you concrete steps to take and the words to say. Hey, Robin. So we are going to talk about this college application process, which I know you are knee deep. Well, probably like more than knee deep, chin deep. I'm like chin. Yeah. I was like, I think it's chin and I'm doggy. Yeah. I'm doggy paddling or treading water. (laughs) Yeah. So you're right in the middle of it. I've done it twice before, so I can feel your pain, of course. But we've got two interviews with two really interesting, fabulous women that offer great perspectives. That's right. The first interview we're going to do, it's actually me talking to my daughter's school counselor. We don't identify her just out of privacy for my own family. And she's a wonderful, wonderful school counselor. She also just asked that if you do know the school or you know who I'm talking to, that these opinions are just coming from her and not from the school district. But she and I talk also about what does that early process look like where you've got a brand new student, freshman, sophomore year, and you're starting to think about college and how do you check in and start that process? And then the second interview is, tell us, Lynn. Yeah. So the second interview is with a woman that I've known since we were 17, actually. We met in the very early days of our college experience. And her name is Jill Schulman, and she is an expert and wrote a wonderful book on the college application process. She's also been an evaluator, so it was really interesting to me hearing that perspective as she's looking at essays. And what I loved about her book was that it's like a best friend's guide, walking you through the whole process. Yeah. Jill knows her stuff. She's been doing it for a long time. I'm deep in the thick of this because my daughter is a high school senior, and I am so lucky that her guidance counselor has agreed to answer some of the questions of what she sees from her professional lens. Welcome to the show, and I wanted to ask you right off the bat, some families make your job really easy and others make it really difficult, and I think every family wants to see you do your job well. What do you wish every family would do? I think you could take this question in a number of different directions. I think when we are looking specifically at the scope of four years together, that can take many different directions. This sounds kind of silly, but almost an understanding of what our job is and what it isn't is really helpful. But that comes with experience and conversation. I think developing a rapport with your counselor is a really great start. Beyond that, when we're looking at the scope, especially with postgraduate planning, I think that the most important piece of my work with families is thinking about the big picture. I find that families come in with a lot of passion and energy, and it makes sense to me. I totally understand where they're coming from. And I think that sometimes we lose the true nature of what our goal is. And for me, a lot of the times, that's just to make sure my students feel heard and supported, no matter what we're covering, whether that's academics or their social emotional well-being, or whether that's planning for college. The piece where it's like, what makes my job more difficult? I had a conversation where a sophomore family was saying, well, when he applies to Harvard, when he applies to XYZ, and I think what's really hard about that is that I'm not going to sit there and say, no, that's not a possibility because we simply don't know. And I would never want to squash someone's dream 
It's more that I wish families would approach the conversation of what postgraduate planning looks like from the lens of what's going to be the best choice for my child. Taking into account the lens that you have seeing where they fit in with the other classmates as well as historically other students of the school. Exactly. I really appreciate when families believe in us and believe in their students. It's not about not believing in them. It's just setting realistic goals and also not putting a value on the name or the label that a school holds. I often find that students will actually go to schools where they've been told this is a good school, you're allowed to attend this school, or social media or just societal standards of what is a good school and what isn't, and they don't love it. We have done a lot of episodes on the toxic achievement culture and really thinking about how do we move away from measuring our kids under these specific labels. But there are some parents who are like, hello, my name is Mr. Smith and my son is going to go to Harvard. And what will you be doing for that? Exactly. Let's pick on Mr. Smith a second, okay? Yep, let's do it. I'm sure there are many Mr. Smiths. So Mr. Smith, he has an idea of what a college success is that he very much wants for his child. How great would it be if instead Mr. Smith came to you and said, you know my child, you know now it's the end of sophomore year, so we kind of see where the academic trends are, what interests are, et cetera. I'd love for him to go to Harvard, but what other schools do you think are good fits or what other things should we be considering? You have access to data that is really Mm -hmm. priceless. Absolutely. The first thing we do when we initiate the conversation with our students about postgraduate planning is I sit them down and I say, I don't want to hear a name of a school. So what I want to know today is what are you looking for? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Not the name of a school. I want to know what is important to you. Right. The combination of experiences, the social, emotional, learning, academic experiences, And if you can't think of a proper noun to attach to those, that's where you really get to the heart of it. Absolutely. I sit down with roughly 50 students every single December, and we begin these really thoughtful conversations where we do back up and where we really look at it from a wide lens and we start narrowing down what matters to you most. Is it your campus size? Is it the proximity to home? Is it the rigor of the institution? Is it your access to professors and small class size? Is it are the most important details, the social aspect of life? What opportunities are you looking for? Are you looking for a research institute? And beyond that, which I think is honestly sometimes the harder part of the conversation is what do you think you want to study? And that's really, really difficult. And I think that our culture pushes teenagers who are supposed to be having fun and being kids to think and know what they want to do for the next five, six years or the rest of their lives when they're 16, 17 years old. And I think that that is a significant amount of pressure to put on a child. And I will say that if you have a student who wants to go into nursing or health sciences, they want to be pre-med, you kind of have to figure that out early, unless you want a very lengthy educational process where you figure that out four years into school. On the other extreme from Mr. Smith, we acknowledge in the podcast, some parents are just hoping that their kids might be ready to go to a college. The victories look a little different, but they're just as sweet. So as a counselor, tell us a little bit about the range of experiences and what families have been able to do with you to get their child to a college. Those students who walk in as 10th, 11th, they're told you won't have the grades to go to a good school, or you should probably go to a tech school. I've heard these words come out of my students' mouths. They're like, my parents have seen my grades. They don't think that I should go to a four-year college. And so begins a conversation of you know relative competency and also desire. And I think the beauty of those conversations of just like, I want my child to be ready. And I think that has looked different with the pandemic, right? I think that that was a particularly universal challenge that was really, really hard in shifting from home to separation at school. A trend that we're seeing the last two, three years kind of post-COVID is that more students want to stay local, 
to their hometowns, home states, or just the general region, they're less likely to branch out because perhaps a desire to stay closer to what they know. And also, we've seen a lot of students go to school and then transfer. In terms of beautiful victories of, I didn't think my child could go to college and now they're applying, that is like ground up work. Oftentimes what I see is in ninth grade, students who don't consider themselves to be college bound, either that's because maybe their own family members didn't go to school or they don't see themselves as active learners or smart. It starts with shifting the narrative to say, you are totally capable of doing this. I worked in very urban areas previously, and that was the narrative, right? I'm not going to go to college. Large piece of my work was not convincing them that they can, but rather showing them that they already have the tools to be successful. They just need to continue to develop them. And so helping them see that they already have strengths that will carry them throughout a collegiate career. What should the parents listening really be honest with themselves about are they doing or not? Our students feel an intense amount of stress on their own. They are hearing from me. They are hearing from our director of guidance regularly. So they know that there are things that they need to do. They have essentially the time ticker clock on Common App for the most part, the platform the majority of our students are using that says you have five days until applications are due. They have pressures from their friends and then they have pressure at home. And I often find that even in my meetings, like my parent and family meetings that I host, that is actually when I see my students the most stressed, which makes sense. I can think back to the you know, natural frustration that sometimes accompanies a parent-child relationship. And what I would say is that they hear you and they are adding that pressure onto them. The amount of relief that my students feel, or at least that I hear from them when they press submit is, is out of this world. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I don't know if you've seen it yet, but on Common App, when you submit your application, there's confetti. And I always say to them, just pretend I'm behind you jumping really excitedly, tossing my own confetti behind you. And I think that for students and for families and myself, frankly, there's a huge relief that happens upon November 1st. And I think the best thing that families can do is just staying calm. They really know the deadlines. A lot of families that I work with hire outside counselors and private college tutors or college coaches, whatever they would like to be called, which I think can be very helpful. And I will say that when it comes down to it, sometimes there is this disalignment. There's a lack of alignment between what a college counselor is saying externally and what we are experiencing in school. And that is actually very stressful. Yeah. Say more. A lot of the times... What the narrative that I hear is we hired this college counselor and they're going to help me get into XYZ school, right? A college counselor should never be signing on to agree to that in the first place. They cannot guarantee any sort of admittance into a specific college or university. That being said, I think a lot of the times when families or students come into my office visibly upset or stressed out, or if I'm getting repeated phone calls or emails from families, it's because an external counselor told them that something's wrong. You didn't take calculus. This is catastrophic. You're never going to get into this school. Or you have a C minus. This is going to ruin your chances. Or you can't apply early action because that school isn't going to consider you and you need to apply regular decision. What they often fail to understand is that we as counselors have direct links and contacts to the admissions representatives that are actually reading the applications. Nine times out of 10, we've met them in person and we have established relationships with them. And so we can actually ask them these really important pressing questions that we want to answer for you. And we often know what the response is already going to be. And so I think that families understandably need support. I think that they look at our jobs, they see how many students we have, they recognize how little time there is in a day. And so to stymie or quell their own anxieties about how their child is doing in the college process, they seek out external resources. Very supportive of that in helping aid a family 
And where I caution students is that you can't always believe everything that they say. Right. It's one opinion. You're paying them to do the job. Technically, with tax dollars, you're also paying me to do my job, but it's a little bit different. My job is to make sure you have a good school that's a good fit for you and that you feel successful, supported, and adequately challenged equally. I fully respect college counselors and the services that they provide to families is sometimes like make or break critical. This holiday season, you might be looking for nutritious, convenient meals to keep you energized on jam-packed days. Factors, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service, and it can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared and dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, you'll eat well, and you'll stay on track with your healthy lifestyle while tackling all of your holiday to-dos. Yeah, so we've been getting these meals at home, and I will tell you, it is so convenient and easy to have a great meal just sitting there ready for you. Takes two minutes to make them. When you're too busy running around to plan for lunch, Factor even has a go-to for lunches. There are grain bowls and salad toppers when you're busy. And no microwave is even required, so you can take them to your office. Enjoy extra convenience any time of day with an assortment of 45 or more add-ons to suit your various preferences and tastes. So you can choose from breakfast items like apple cinnamon pancakes, bacon and cheddar egg bites, and potato and bacon and egg breakfast skillets. You know, during the holidays, sometimes our diet tends to sort of slide a little bit. This is a way to help keep you healthy, too. They even have easy wellness boosts. So they have cold pressed juices, shakes, and smoothies too, especially after the holidays. Yeah, and those juices are delicious. I love those. All right, so head to factormeals.com slash fluster50 and use code fluster50 to get 50% off. That's code fluster50 at factormeals.com slash fluster50 to get 50% off. It is definitely the season where people can get sick. But proactively support your family's immune systems and stay ahead of the game with Beekeepers Naturals Propolis Throat Spray and these amazing new Propolis Throat Soothing Lollipops that my son loves. You're telling me that there's a soothing lollipop that we can give our kids? They are delicious. They have a defense providing propolis. They've got vitamin D and zinc and wildflower honey. They can actually love the taste of a beekeeper's natural product and we can get what they need into their bodies without battling over something that tastes horrible. They have it in a throat spray that you can always have on hand, but you can include the lollipops inside their lunchbox and they have 50% less sugar. Vitamin D, zinc, wildflower honey. It soothes kids' throats and it supports their immune systems. Today, Beekeepers Naturals is offering you an exclusive offer. So go to beekeepersnaturals.com slash flusterclucks or enter Fluster Clucks and get 20% off your order. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R-A-L-S dot com slash Fluster Clucks or enter code Fluster Clucks. Beekeepers Naturals products are also available at Target, Whole Foods, Amazon, CVS, and Walgreens. Imagine for a moment something that looks like a dryer sheet but it's not. It's a liquidless laundry detergent sheet that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. There's no measuring, no mess, no heavy lifting of a big, unrecyclable jug. So you know what we're talking about? We're talking about Earth Breeze. Earth Breeze is an incredible detergent. It works. I say this all the time, I have a very stinky family. And yet they're so lovely. I need a detergent that works well. It is delivered to your door. The packaging is lightweight. It's biodegradable. I have so much space. Every time I do a load of laundry, I still say to myself, why didn't they think of this before? Join over 2 million Americans that are making a difference with Earth Breeze, making a difference in your clean, fresh-smelling laundry, and also making a difference for the environment. If you're still not convinced, they offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, you get a full refund, no questions asked, no return necessary. Trust me, there is no reason not to switch. So right now, our listeners can subscribe to EarthBreeze and save 40%. 
Go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclux to get started. And that's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclux for 40% off. Earthbreeze.com slash flusterclux. Okay, we're back. For a lot of parents, the impact of paying for college is obviously the biggest source of the stress. Most families are dealing with that. Touching on the finances of things is a very critical piece of the conversation. And oftentimes where my work with a family comes into play the most, it's less about the name and more about like, how are we going to actually afford this? And can you help me navigate that conversation with my child? A challenge of the financial piece of it, which is something that should be on everyone's mind. Right. As college prices soar into the 80,000, 90,000 range in some circumstances, I mean, I know in my lifetime, schools will hit over 100. And by in my lifetime, I mean in the next few years. Right, right. And really disheartening, frankly. But I think one of the things that can be really helpful is that when we have students, right, because there's a huge difference between financial need and financial aid and merit-based aid, right? That's just a conversation that we have with students, merit-based meaning it's based off your merit, right? Your academics, um, how strong of a student you are. And oftentimes we will talk to our students about making sure that you have a balanced list. That is, you also have economic safeties on there. I always thought of myself as a pretty hands-off parent, but it's like, how's my child going to know what is economically a safety without getting involved? Parents have to step in. Sometimes the conversations will go more easily than others. That's part of the like setting the groundwork of the narrative of how you're communicating to your child about college. Are you being transparent with your finances, which is a really difficult conversation at times, but is a really important one. I have I had a student last year who really wanted to go to a big Southern state school. All that he wanted in the world was to attend the school, gets in, and because grades weren't necessarily stellar academically, he didn't qualify for merit-based aid, and he didn't really qualify for as much financial aid as his family probably needed because he was out of state. They just can't support that. And so he didn't end up going. And a huge part of our conversation was reframing it and looking at alternative options and having really big conversations with 17 and 18 year olds about what debt looks like and how it compounds and how you have to start paying it and something to talk about early with your kids as early as you can. I finished my CSS profile the other day. <laughs> oh, gosh. But it's also very weird. It was like, I guess now you get to see all of our tax returns, honey. <laughs> I don't know. I guess in older generations, there was a little bit more of a financial privacy, and there isn't mm -hmm. that anymore. Is there a term in the industry where people don't diversify their list enough that they end up not getting in anywhere? Isn't there a name for that? Say you have a perfect 4.5 GPA and you are applying to all schools where having like perfect grades is the ticket in the door. You are putting yourself at a major disadvantage. That's the same case if you have a really strong 3.5 even and you're only looking at schools that are at that like 3.8, 3.9 range. You're not diversifying your list enough. And so you are putting yourself at a disadvantage. Do you have students at your school that despite recommendations that you offer, they still don't apply to those safeties or foundation schools? So then they're left with no option? I would never say they're left with no option because there are always options. And it hurts my heart. And I would never say I told you so because I'm not that kind of person often a huge piece of my job is finding schools that are relatively similar profiles to the schools that they're interested in and adding them on. More often than not, I'm adding on safety schools that I want students to consider. And it's often after that first round of early action where they're getting a lot of denials or wait lists or deferrals and feeling defeated. So I'll often say, I would love to see you apply to some target reach safety schools the first round so you know you have somewhere where you want to go. There could be pushback from the parents so they don't end up applying. Yep. The parents are like, you're not going there. 
Yes. And that's disheartening. Oftentimes, a safety is going to be the best fit for the student based on what they're looking for, right? Oftentimes, safeties provide merit-based aid. They provide a social and academic life balance for students in a really healthy, positive ways where they can be very active contributors to their community and college campus, where that might not be the case at a school that's a reach. It sounds like if you had your way, Mm -hmm. every family of freshmen (laughs) would sit around the beginning of the year and say, okay, we're going to strip down the college experience into a bunch of experiences and think about what you want and know that wherever you go, We're not allowed to tell anybody where you're going to remove that egoic, toxic element from it. Is this where you would want to go if no one could know where your child was going? A hundred percent. That would be my dream world. So, hey, Lynn. Hey, Robin. We're so excited that Jill Shulman is here with us today. And Jill is the author of College Admissions Cracked, Saving Your Kid and Yourself from the Madness. As you know, I'm in this. I found her book incredibly helpful. It's like a best friend's guide, holding your hand through the whole process, both on a practical level, but also giving you the support and second guessing where you're going to need the support along the way. So I highly recommend the book. So welcome, Jill. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. So Jill, you have a Facebook group for the readers of your book called The Chill Parents Revolution. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and what you're trying to create? What revolution are you hoping to make? Oh, well, it's just a perspective revolution, really. And Robin, you said something before we started recording that I loved, and that was how shocking it was that your relationship with your child throughout this whole process wasn't worse. Like you'd gotten all these warnings about this way it was going to be from who knows, friends, the media, everyone saying how awful it was. And it's not been as awful as you had feared. And for some people, they think, oh, I've got this. I'm going to be so chill. I've got it all under control. And then it's like hell on earth trying to figure out how to communicate with their teenager. The Chill Parents Revolution It's just a lot about self-forgiveness and empowerment of both yourself and your kid. Empowerment for yourself is a lot about, yeah, you messed that up, but it's not undoable. The first information session I went to, what happens is you go on a college visit and you sit in a room with a bunch of other parents and kids and they sell the college to you because people forget that colleges are a business. And a lot of the hype that's surrounding it is marketing, just like any other business. So I'm sitting in this information session. And at the end, they say, do you have any questions? And I raise my hand and I ask a question. And I watch my child slump into the seat like she was praying that the cushions would absorb her from this crazy lady asking questions right and left, co-opting the experience. Okay, Mess that one up. The next college visit, I knew to bite my tongue and keep my mouth shut before I make this about me instead of her. Mm. I would imagine that that's one of the messages that you really want to convey to parents is that this is not about you, parents. It is easy for us to get absorbed into sort of look what my kid did and look where my kid is going and all of that kind of humble bragging that parents do and the sort of the parents' competition about it. That's a pretty compelling soup that people get sucked into, isn't it? Yeah, there's also the protection issue, the appropriateness of how to protect your child, you know, when they're an infant and they can't hold their own head up versus now when the protection mechanism that goes into overdrive becomes micromanagement And it's actually sabotaging their kid instead of helping them. I know that this is part of your perspective as well, Lynn. I've worked as an evaluator in colleges and I have seen what happens. Some of these kids send in an application and it's obvious that they're box checking instead of following their bliss and having a childhood. 
And what happens is all those applications start to blend together. Whereas the child who has maybe had less micromanagement and structure and less fear guiding them throughout their entire education process, actually, those are the applications that stand out. Lynn, when you were applying to college, people were looking for well-rounded, someone who was both an athlete and an academic and a student leader. The Gen X generation, that's what we experience. But the term now is really about the pointy kid. The pointy kid is someone who has found a passion and you see them try and cultivate a skill along the way. If it's done right, it's what you just said, Jill. Organically, a kid flocks to a certain thing and has the space and the freedom to keep doing that thing in different ways versus when the parent's desperately looking for that point and looking for that direction where it's superimposed upon the kid. Oh, yeah. My favorite is when students come to me and say, well, I have to find my passion. Right. And my parents are helping me find my passion. So I know there's a lot of talk right now coming out about mental health and parents really are worried about their kids. One of the things we know is that very often people wait a long time before they seek help for themselves or their kids. In fact, parents on average wait anywhere from two to eight years before they get help for their child who's dealing with anxiety. Okay, so look, you can get a therapist through Talkspace. You don't have to wait. You know how much we talk about developing skills and tools to be able to manage your emotions, and Talkspace makes it easy and affordable. Yeah, it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your home. There's no need to commute to appointments. You don't miss time at work, or you don't have to line up childcare in order to attend sessions. So it's really mental health care made easy. It's secure. It's private. It's affordable. It's in network with most major insurers. So there's really no reason why you need to put off getting the help you need for things like anxiety, depression. There's a lot going on in the world right now, and sometimes it just is really helpful to get the support you need from a licensed professional. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $80 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $80 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. I love fall fashion. I like bringing out the different types of boots. I like the jeans. I like the sweaters. It's fun. I travel a ton during the fall. So that means I want a shoe that's going to take me on a plane, through the airport, move around a city, get onto that presenter stage. And you know what? Vessi is getting it done for me. I love Vessi. My weekend Chelsea boot is my fall go-to shoe. It looks great with jeans. I love it with pants. I can even wear it with leggings and athleisure for a workout. Well, and I love the Soho sneaker. I'll tell you that it's so comfortable. It's so versatile. I'm just wearing it everywhere I go. So if you haven't met Vessi yet, Imagine shoes that can handle anything from a milk spill to a sudden shower. They are lightweight and waterproof. These shoes are a busy woman's secret weapon. And my Vessies are a lifesaver and a great looking lifesaver. Okay, so Fluster Cluckers, you need a shoe that can juggle everything that you do all in a day's work. Go to Vessi.com slash Fluster. That's V E. S-S-I dot com slash Fluster and enter code Fluster at checkout to receive your 15% discount. Let's get ourselves some comfy, stylish, and super practical shoes. Plus, they've got free shipping to a bunch of places, so score your new mom life essential with 15% off by going to Vessi.com slash Fluster using the code at checkout. Okay, so now back to the show. 
So you are confirming what I thought was true is that you guys, when you're looking at the applications, it's just like the fourth grade project. I always joke that when my son, we were looking at all these fourth grade projects and I said to my son's friend, Elliot, Elliot, your project is really great. And he said, yeah, my mom did a really good job. (laughs) (laughs) College admissions people can tell what is really sort of curated by a parent, even an essay written by a parent an application completed by a parent compared to something that a child is presenting as their own? Does that just sort of scream out to the people who are reading these applications? Yeah. The other piece of it is there are applications that have an undercurrent of fear to them. Oh, say more about that. That's very interesting. And supplication. You're an applicant, not a supplicant. When you write an application thinking about what they want to hear, it comes across as disingenuous. The key to a great application is saying what you want to say instead of what you think other people want to hear. What's the thing that you talk about so much that it could potentially drive your parents and your friends insane? Oh, what a great question to ask. Right. Because there it is. There's the thing that's on their mind. There's the thing that's interesting to them. There's the thing that they get passionate about, if we're going to use that word, is the thing that you talk about so much that your parents are like, are we going to hear more about sea otters? Really? I'm sort of in this and from the anxiety perspective, and I know that this is a very anxiety producing experience. What do you see parents who are doing it well? Parents who are really sort of managing this, and maybe it's because it's their third kid doing it, or maybe even their second kid. What do you see them doing differently compared to parents that you're sort of like, well, first of all, the commonality is that all of them, bar none, say, I just want my kid to be happy and I'm just going to let them make all the decisions. (laughs) All of them, their intentions, their good intentions are solid. I have so much empathy for them. The ones who have self-knowledge actually let their child take the lead. And they do the bite your tongue until it's bleeding stuff. The communication with their child is more about listening for real. Listening to what the kid is trying to tell them. I'm not ready to go to college yet. Or... I have no idea where to start. Help me. And letting go of preconceived notions about what I call the Kardashian colleges, which are the famous colleges that are famous for being famous. Not that there's no substance behind them, but they're glamorous. They're sparkly. The media covers them all the time. And they give you no better opportunities for an outstanding education than the 4,600 other colleges in the country. So letting go of the preconceived notions that, oh, I know the name of this college, that means it's a good college worthy of my baby. Mm -hmm. And worthy of my money. The parents that I see finding that particularly hard are the parents of these students. Those parents cling sometimes to just what they've heard of because it's safe, because it feels less mysterious to them. And then my job, when I talk to the child, I'm working with the student more than the parents. But when I talk to the child, it's taking away some of the mystical power that the name brand colleges have. Well, there's another thing I say to them, and I know I'm the first person that says this. If they say, I'm applying to Harvard, do you think I have a good chance? And I will say, to clarify, the valedictorian of your high school has a 95% chance of denial from Harvard. And you have the same 5% chance of getting admitted as anybody else. And the students who apply to Harvard self-select. So the applicant pool does not consist of students like that kid who's barely passing in your English class. 
we talk about this a lot at our house that it, because of what you just pointed out, it's not a contest, it's a lottery ticket because there are many qualified people who will be denied schools and there will be something about your application that you get that lottery ticket. So there is a little bit of a chance now because there are so many qualified applicants who might look a lot like you or not. The other thing that was, I think, the most helpful in terms of the prestige factor is stop using the phrase good school immediately. If your kids are six years old, now is the time. And here's another one, top tier. That terminology was invented by the rankings. And the rankings were invented to sell magazines. U.S. News and World Report was behind Time and Newsweek in sales. And somebody invented the rankings to attract more eyeballs and sell more magazines. If you have a household where the parents don't use those types of phrases when they talk about schools, oh, yeah, that's a good school. If you really are in a vacuum where you're not qualifying schools, you are creating an environment where all schools feel more like a possibility. The majority of colleges in this country admit almost everyone who applies. Most people in the country are more worried about paying for college than they are getting into these top tier schools. The focus is more on financial. Now, it also makes some of the top tier schools more expensive because if you qualify for full financial aid, these schools are rich enough to give it to you. Let's segue into that because the paying situation is actually quite real. So I want to give a quick cheat sheet to the listeners of what I've understood because it actually then relates to the way the parents do need to be involved. If your income is under a certain amount and your kids apply to schools that have needs met aid, that puts you in a position where many schools will actually work out. If they get in and your family's financial situation qualifies, you will find an affordable option. The flip side, obviously, is the parents who can pay full price. They apply early decision because they don't need to know what a financial package looks like. And then there are the families that are going to be figuring out a financial aid package that includes loans or scholarships. And if it's going to be merit-based or scholarships based on income, I think it's really important for parents to figure out what they can afford. And a kid doesn't know what the parents can afford. Well, here's the piece of it that I tell everybody is have that financial fit conversation really early because otherwise parents can take on the role of dream crushers and that sucks. It happens all the time. Like my kid got into their dream school. Oops, we can't pay for it. Right. Say you're buying your 17 year old needs a car and you say, all right, so let's go to the Mercedes dealership and then we're going to go to the BMW dealership and then we're going to go to the Porsche dealership. But we can really afford to get you a 10 year old Honda Accord, which would be a really good car for you. But we're going to shop at all these other places. We're going to let you drive all these other cars. And then once you pick out the car that you really love, we're going to let you know that you can't afford to buy it. I love that analogy so much. Jill, do you think that in terms of your experience with families and talking about that, do you think that people do have that financial discussion up front? Or do you see more of the other situation where they're trying to pick the best school, they're trying to pick the good school, and then suddenly they find themselves in this trap of being a dream crusher? Most people are so blinded by the glamour and by the media crush surrounding 30, 50 schools out of the many thousands that they're really intent upon getting in and then figuring out how they're going to pay for it. Like I tell parents, don't send your kid to the school where you're going to be eating ramen for the next how many years. It's not worth it. No parent I've ever talked to has regretted choosing the affordable school, but many parents I've talked to in retrospect really are like, why did I make so many sacrifices? 
Lynn, do you have for the parents who are listening who are twitching a little bit because they don't like what we're saying about that? What would you say to them? Well, I'm used to making parents twitch, so that's well within my wheelhouse. This is about having a conversation that feels uncomfortable. And part of what I see with parents getting caught up in their own anxiety, their own patterns, right? Oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to give my kid exactly what they want. And I'm going to disappoint them. And people are going to judge us or people are going to judge me. It really is about looking at the big picture, which in that moment of needing to have the perfect choice, right? When people say like, oh, I'm going to find the perfect school or this is the perfect school for my child. Look, I'll tell you, there are so many other things. I mean, certainly affordability is a really key discussion to have. And Jill, you also mentioned something my ear perked up at. It's also being able to listen to your child and to recognize whether or not they're even ready to go to school and what kind of school would be the right place for them. I have seen so many kids that have gone through high school in this absolute pressure cooker with the goal of getting into a top school, they get into the top school and either they don't have the emotional and the social skills to handle it, or they have been so exhausted by the process that once they get there, they don't even know what to do. And if you say, I want my kid to be happy, then you've really got to pay attention to what they need and what they want. I really want parents to define what that means. And it really is often... I want everything to go smoothly and I want things to go as I imagine them to go. It's so important to have those discussions about not only is this financially viable, but is this the place for my kid? And is this the place that my child wants to go? And are they ready to do this thing called college, which is going to cost a lot of money and a lot of effort for a family? I have to say that as much as the pandemic brought all kinds of horrors, one silver lining it brought was debunking the myth that everyone has to follow the same path. I agree. You know what I wanted to bring up? The month of April. And what happens during that month crushes some kids. Parents contribute in a way that they don't realize. A lot of parents are disappointed by the notifications that come in and they start making excuses. I mean, this is pervasive. Oh, my son didn't get in because a superstar lacrosse player applied to the same college. Or my kid didn't get in because of that 1B sophomore year. They don't think about their kid who's listening. And the message is, oh, I've disappointed my mom. She's devastated and I feel like crap. And I didn't do the thing that she's been working toward all these years. And suddenly it's the parent who needs consoling. So I'm just putting it out there. Like, don't be that parent who needs to be consoled if their kid doesn't get into their reach schools. Lynn and I talk about blame a lot. Yes, that's the word I was thinking of. So blame is so toxic. So we have to remember to not speak with blame about the denials. Well, the other piece is that parents, they look at it as rejections of their parenting, right? And the other thing too, is when we talk about that blaming, because I've heard that before, Jill, like, oh, that other boy in his class applied also, is that it turns this thing into a competition. And I think the message that I'm hearing from you in so many different ways, which is so great, is that this is not a competition. There are plenty of places for all kids to go to college. We've created this environment where it's really like, if this person is applying, it's going to take my kid's spot. And that whole mentality that it's competitive. Nobody knows who's going to apply that year and what the applicant pool is going to look like that year. It's not a competition. It's a lottery. How important is it to come across as someone likable? So as an evaluator, the whole point is I'm reading the application and there are lots of metrics going on. There are numbers, there are letters, there are what other people say about the student. And then you get to the essay where you get to sit back and hear the student's voice and hear their story. I'm looking to find diamonds and glittery gems, not to weed students out. And the way I find diamonds, those are the ones I connect with. And their essay 
is real and human and personable and I get them better by the end of it than I did just looking at their transcript. If I start to connect with the student, then I start to envision them on campus in a class. Oh, taking that English class and contributing to it and getting involved on campus instead of sequestering in their room playing video games, right? And contributing to the campus and, oh, yeah, they would love this kid that I just recommended for admission. Maybe they'll be roommates, you know, and you start to see them as a human being instead of numbers and letters. And that's all that the essay needs to do. The message you're giving is that if a parent gets in there and tries to write the essay. I'm reading it and I'm like, is this a 17 year old using the word facilitate in their (laughs) essay? Yeah. You know, is this person trying to impress me by just listing all of their achievements in their essay? It comes across as either desperate or arrogant when you do that. You know, when people say, what do evaluators want to hear? Well, I just want to hear like what you want to (laughs) say. And in in order to figure out what you want to say, you got to take some of the pressure and lower the stake. It takes confidence to write well. And the only way that I know to help students gain confidence is to say, got to take some risks. As we're like butzing around trying to figure out what the heck is going on inside of your head and excavate the stories that are already inside of you. Like you don't have to pluck some never before used topic out of thin air. I read every topic. What we have to do is just find the little stories inside of yourself that are really meaningful to you. I want you to give our listeners the language you would use when you're beginning this process? Like, how do you want a parent to set the stage for this process? And then I also want you to give us the language you would use as you're waiting for the acceptances and the rejections to come in. Verbalize your love and support of your kid no matter what happens. Like, if you get into schools or if you don't, I'm gonna love you the same. And if you don't get in anywhere, We can march over to the local community college that will save me a ton of money and register in July. If you want to go to college, it matters less where than what you do once you get there. If you go to any college with a great attitude that you're going to take advantage of all that this college has to offer, chances are really good it's going to work out for you. I'm going to give a shameless plug for your book, Jill, because I feel like you really walk a parent through step by step what to say and what to expect and how to be supportive. It's a really great read. Oh, thank you. I have the same vibe in online in the Intrepid Applicant Essay Writing Platform where I tried to make writing the college essay easy and guide them step by step as if they had a private essay coach, but in an affordable and very efficient way. And then maybe one last thing. You had mentioned a gap year. You had mentioned looking at other options. You had mentioned that this process is not for everybody. I mean, the whole goal of parenting is supposed to be to give your kid independence to go on without you. Yeah, which is autonomy. So you are not in favor of people renting an apartment in the college town where their child is going? Yeah, I'm not. That happens. I mean, I also think that the less you hear from your kid once they go to college, the better. Parents are so disappointed when the kid isn't consulting them about which classes they're choosing. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Yay, you mom and dad, you did something right. Yeah. I was at an open house this weekend at a campus with my daughter, and I had a private conversation with the dean, and no one else was around. So it was like a very honest conversation. We talked about the fact that parents are more involved. And obviously, if you're a listener to this, you may have kids who have accommodations now and you work with the schools. This school said, We think that it's very important to make a shift 
from the school and the parents accommodating the child to the child stepping in and learning self-advocacy for themselves. We do not want to communicate with the parents. The student has to be the one to communicate their needs and their accommodations. One of the things that I talk about all the time is that accommodations in the absence of skill building means that they're going to expect those accommodations to follow them into college the rest of their lives, right? And I say this all the time when I'm speaking, that I have worked with many successful professionals that are depending upon the accommodations that they've had their whole lives. And suddenly those accommodations don't work because the court doesn't care if you used to get extended time. And the electronic medical records don't care if you need to be perfect before you submit them. And so you're delaying. The school doesn't care whether or not you need extra time to submit your grades so that they can close out the semester. It really is important for parents to not depend on the idea when their child goes to college that the goal is to find a college that will continue to accommodate in the absence of skill building. That's the huge thing that I see all the time. And I know for a fact that colleges are feeling very trapped by that and feeling very overwhelmed by that. And the expectation that a college is going to be able to make sure that your kid is okay all the time is just not realistic. And that may mean that your child's not ready yet to go to college. In addition to the affordability conversation that's key, the off-ramping of the accommodations sounds like that is also key. And also as a determinant of are you ready or are you not quite yet? I live in a college town at dinner parties with professors who are telling stories about parents who are calling them and saying, I'm in the CIA and you gave my child a B. What? (laughs) It really is quite astounding what parents are expecting right now that colleges will provide for their kids. Sometimes the efforts of the colleges have become quite absurd as well. Whether your child has accommodations or not, Parents can take all kinds of baby steps along the way to prepare their kid for independence and relinquish accommodations that they've been making. The best preparation that I did, I'm patting myself on the back as a parent because I've made so many mistakes along the way. But one thing I did right was when my daughter needed a doctor's appointment, I gave her the phone number of the doctor. She was in high school. Yeah, right. I had realized that I always made all the appointments and I brought her to the appointments and I gave her the phone number of the doctor and she came back to me and said, I need a referral. And I said, okay, go get a referral. And I retired as her medical manager forever. And I realized that that's the best preparation for college, not buying things for the dorm room. (laughs) Thank you for all of this information. I think you are very reassuring in your directness, and I love that. Just don't talk about it all the time (laughs) to your kid. (laughs) Right. And one of the assignments I give parents as they're going through the high school phase, when they're meeting other kids, like if you're running into your kid's friends, is do not ask them about college. Ask them about something else. Ask them about what they're doing. What are they looking forward to? What makes their hearts sing? What fun have they had? I think we give the message to kids in so many ways, especially the last two years of high school need to be focused on figuring out where you're going to go. And I just think, boy, it eats up a lot of energy and a lot of time. Yeah, nobody is just one thing, where they're applying to college or what they're going to major in. Those kinds of questions drive me crazy. Because it puts way more pressure on a 17-year-old than is worthwhile. And on a family. It becomes a family affair. Yes. So thank you for all your wisdom. And thank you for all your questions, Robin. Okay. So Robin, you you got it all figured out now? Y'all set? Kept telling my daughter, hang in there. You got this. And we're going to figure out a way to celebrate and burn off some steam when it's over. And just like labor and birth. 
(laughs) We're in the ring of fire right now. Thanks for listening. And if you found this podcast helpful, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find this information. And if you'd like to dig deeper on any of these topics, we have specialized playlists on our Spotify profile and the link is in the show notes. Topics like teens, depression, and OCD. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Robin. Hey there, I'm Debbie Reber, the founder of Tilt Parenting and the author of the book, Differently Wired. The mission of Tilt is to change the way neurodivergence, whether that's having a learning disability, having ADHD, being gifted, autistic, or some combination of all of the above, is perceived and experienced so differently wired kids and the parents like us raising them can truly thrive. On the Tilt Parenting podcast, I get to talk with authors, therapists, educators, and parenting experts who are committed to this mission. I ask the questions my listeners are most curious about when it comes to supporting our kids. And in turn, my guests share strategies for challenges, out-of-the-box ideas for navigating school, best practices for therapies, tips for advocating, and so many thoughtful insights on what it really takes to help our kids grow up feeling seen and respected so they can create awesome lives for themselves. I know that raising a differently wired kid can feel overwhelming and isolating, but I promise you, you are not alone and it can feel so much better. If you're on this parenting journey, come listen to Tilt Parenting. Together, we can shift this paradigm and show up for our exceptional kids with hope, possibility, and joy.